Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for um, joining us today to, to talk about uranium. Um, timely because of the huge run up and timely because of a little bit of correction in the spot market, um, which is always anticipated, right? Um, but uh, why don't we start off with you, Fabi? What, what what do you think the the, the lay of the land is right now? We, we did have this big run up. We're trading around about 85 bucks a pound spot. The market's freaking out. Is this over? Let's get the lay of the land from you. I kind of love it that the market's freaking out um, about such a move, because if you uh, have tried to hear about what the actual traders of uranium and the spot market are saying is, you know, there's barely any volume. And whenever the, the run up did happen, they kind of all mostly step back. And so when retail really thinks that this is the end all be all of, you know, uranium price as we know it, you actually have to take a look at the term market and you see companies, you know, looking at RFPs and holding strong and not really going down this line of, you know, all of a sudden we we found some uranium hidden in a warehouse somewhere and, and the prices are going down. That's precisely the opposite of what's happening. They're holding strong. Prices have not been this high in a very long time. They're continuing to climb higher. So I understand how, you know, because with other commodities, gold, silver, copper, et cetera, there is a very liquid market that we can always take a look at and base ourselves off that market. When it comes to uranium, the spot market that we look at, I look at at it myself too every single day. It's only a part of the story and it's very thinly traded. And also, I want to give a, a little bit of a disclaimer here. Also, fairly easy to manipulate. Um, and I don't want to imply that, you know, we're, <laughs> we're that anybody is trying to manipulate it. I'm just saying that it is easy to do so if you are a financial player and you know <laughs> what you're doing. And if you're a producer that has contracts somewhat tied up to the price of spot at some point it does become mathematically um obvious and easy to lift your whole book and ma make mm -hmm. it very very valuable by just you know bidding up the prices so just a thought hey po possibly what's happened in the lithium market in china once they open that spot market lithium prices got hammered and now we're seeing all these Chinese companies buying up all these lithium companies that are, you know, now dirt cheap, which is uh, the, the MA so. happening in lithium is <laughs> is beyond any comparison. So, yes. So you may not be implying it, but I'm implying it. So there we go. <laughs> That's fair enough. <laughs> yeah, uh, Jesse, you're going to move on to you. Um, so Kaz, Kaz Adam Prom, Cameco, around, they're all missing their desired production targets, um, yeah. making supply even tighter than expected. So. You know, all these analysts are, are are all screaming now, you know, supply shortage is coming. And now it's being exasperated even more by these stories. These, these majors are saying we can produce this much and they're not. So what's the lay of the land there? Yeah, I think it's a very fascinating development. Obviously, it makes for an even more bullish setup than most people were anticipating to begin with, as if we needed any more catalysts with the current supply demand dynamics when it comes to the uranium market. But yeah, because Adamprom produces some 30% of global uranium supply, the largest publicly traded producer is likely not going to meet their production targets for 2024 and 2025. This is due to sulfuric acid shortages, which is it's very difficult to get the quantity of sulfuric acid that they actually need. Um, transporting, it's very difficult. So it's not a simple fix. A lot of people are out there saying, oh, they can just why don't they just buy it from China or something like that? It's not so simple. You can't just fly it over there on planes. So I think it's more of a systemic issue um, that's going to play out potentially for, for quite a while. So yeah, obviously uh, very bullish supply, more constrained than we originally thought. And, you know, in terms of the, the spot price, Fabi brought up a, a great point that it's very opaque. You don't get the same instantaneous uh, reporting on price, like real-time price, like you would in other markets like gold and silver, for example. Um, I personally don't pay a ton of attention to the day-to-day -day price movements, the week-to-week -week or even the month-to-month. -month. I just think we're going steadily up and to the right over the course of the next few years, and I'm strapped in and ready to go. <laughs> awesome. Um, Jesse, talk about like I'm starting to hear this AI buzzword a little bit more and how nuclear plays a role. Like uh, 
So why is that becoming a theme story here all of a sudden? Well, before I dive into it real quick, I want to give a shout out to Doomberg who who brought this to my attention through his fantastic newsletter. And um, AI requires an incredible amount of energy. Uh, this is something that a lot of people didn't factor into the whole AI picture. The uh, AI revolution is real. I do think the the handful of stocks holding up the broad market are massively overvalued, including NVIDIA. I think we're going to see, this is a bit of an aside, but you know, it, during the dot-com bubble, the internet really did change the world. Um, but that didn't mean that there wasn't massive overvaluation. And I think we're facing a similar situation here. However, AI is real. It's here to stay. It's only going to continue to develop. The amount of energy it requires is massive. We are seeing a push from governments all around the world towards clean carbon-free electricity. Nuclear is the only solution for that. I think everybody on this call knows that. And we've seen Amazon Web Services Data Center in Pennsylvania actually directly powered by a nuclear power station nearby, which I think is a major sign of things to come. I think the trend's going to continue. And again, we don't even need this catalyst, but it's, it's just another feather in the cap. <laughs> it's the icing on the icing on the icing of the cake at this point. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll speak of catalyst, and Gwen, I'm going to point this at you. Um, let's talk about these proposed uh, bans of importing Russian um, uranium. And, you know, we chatted about a bifurcation in the market and how that could play out. So I'm going to throw that. What, what's going on there? Yeah, so so I, I'm just going to apologize for my voice. I'm drinking tea constantly because I do have the plague, but at least this is a virtual <laughs> conference. So I'm not going to give it to anybody else. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, I mean, the bifurcation of the market is this is amplifying the situation, right? The situation is that globally, we don't make enough uranium to meet demand. Um, and especially in the years ahead, globally, we don't. If it was just easy to move uranium around and, and do all of that, there just isn't enough. But in the midst of that shortage, we're also splitting the market in half. And it's happening slowly and quickly. Um, it, it has gradually picked up speed, this idea. You know, I remember five years ago, there were certain newsletter writers out there hammering the table on, does anybody even know that America is so reliant on Russia for its uranium to power 20% of its energy? And it was a bit of a shock story at that point because it wasn't very common. It wasn't particularly common knowledge. And that knowledge has, has definitely disseminated. And now there's a lot more people who are like, oh man, that's true. And some of those people are politicians, importantly, and that's why over the last three years, we've had move after move after move. And I think, you know, at Christmas time or in December, whenever it was, that we saw the latest political thing, which was them, which was the U.S. government putting half a billion dollars, committing half a billion dollars towards supporting the build out of the ability to produce nuclear fuel. So that's process uranium and turn it into fuel. That's another step. Guess what? That processing capacity also is controlled by Russia primarily, right? That's where the heart of our the world's nuclear processing infrastructure exists. And so the U.S. government was like, oh, guess what? Not only do we need to really support production of uranium in friendly countries, certainly including our own, but we need to be able to turn that uranium into fuel. And that was part of, that was one of a few things that happened around about the same time, including Kazadam Prom's big reveal, which was not a big reveal for anybody who pays attention to uranium, but anyway, <laughs> that they were not even going to come close to meeting their production guidelines. Just to further Jesse's point there, I mean, this was not a surprise. Like the way that you pull uranium from the ground with these in situ, in situ mines requires significant advanced development. You got to be drilling wells like a year, two years in advance. So it's not as they didn't suddenly, you know, run out of the ability also, if people have wondered about the sulfuric acid component, oh, are other, you know, are other ISR plants or mines going to struggle because of a lack of sulfuric acid globally? Well, most ISR mines don't actually use sulfuric acid because it turns out using acid really acidifies the environment. And most places in the world don't let that happen to a very large extent. There's a few mines. There's one in Australia and whatnot. But in Kazakhstan, that's the way that they mine it. In other places, we use basically hydrogen peroxide. Um, so anyways, the sulfuric acid situation is very real. They don't have enough. They haven't been drilling the, drilling the wells. So Kazakhstan is not happening. But Kazakhstan news came out at the same time as this government news of, of, develop, of supporting the build out of nuclear fuel 
um, capacity and the the price really responded. And I, I took that not as, oh my gosh, everyone really responded to that political announcement. No, it was just that that's another domino, right? The government just keeps setting up these dominoes and knocking them down one after another. And each time one falls, people are like, yet yeah, there's another example of how committed the U.S. government is to this course of action. They've been on this path for three years and they are powering ahead on this path. They are really committed to it. And so I think we're going to continue to see those political developments. I think things like reducing barriers to small modular reactors. I think that's another thing that needs to happen on the political front to accelerate this uranium story. Right now, small modular reactors need to go through basically the same permitting process as a full-scale nuclear plant, which is an inappropriately arduous uh, process. You might say it's inappropriately arduous even for the large nuclear plants, but that's sort of a different discussion. Um, and so they need to reduce those barriers. So these are the kinds of moves that are happening and they're really underway. And there's been so many moves at this point that now the market's like, this is real. Like this isn't just political arm waving. This is real. This is happening. Mm -hmm. The US is developing their own capacity, very demonstrated. and. At the same, if you know, if the long held up in Senate resolution passes to ban Russian uranium with caveats that we can continue to buy if we really need it, Putin will likely say, screw you guys, you guys just can't have any right now. And that would accelerate the market again. But this is just part of a story that's been involved, that's been that's taken slow steps and fast steps over the past five years. And it's only making a tough situation worse for those who need uranium. I kind of find it interesting. Um, there's other minerals and metals out there that the, you know, the U.S. basically solely relies on, you know, production from non-allies. And um, but it seems like the uranium narrative is the one that's getting the movement from the, the, the political side the most. And I'm wondering if that's going to create like a framework for how they progress other minerals down the road. That's a total a topic for another day but it just kind of that's what kind of came to mind when you when you talked about that and uh, Absolutely. I wonder and I wonder if the market is they just got some sort of you know nuclear is a scary word to some people still right and going oh Russia nuclear oh my god like oh my god right we got to do something about this now but if you look at you know the US relying on graphite 100% from China and all those, the gravity they need to to make all their their batteries for their, their military, and it's 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 equally as big as a problem. Um, but uh, yeah, those are just my thoughts there. Um, if I could chime in, I do really think that this political process that they're figuring out for uranium will have parallels. Like I do think it's charting the course for graphite, even copper. Like. There's a it lot of to. minerals that <laughs> as we try and go green, which of course is, you know, a big fundamental part of what's going on here, um, we need we need security of supply and we don't have it for a bunch of these minerals. And I do think that this is like this is laying the groundwork. So absolutely. Yeah. Fabi, we're gonna we're gonna rope you in here. Um so I've been I've been in the industry for 25 years and I've, you know, I remember uh, putting together a uranium company, which held the next gen assets way before next gen. And, uh, like I, had failure, I, I had a, I had a credit card that said, you know, tight, um, Titan uranium. And I went to go buy something and, uh, pay for it at a restaurant in, in New York. And they were literally like, Oh my God, like what, what, what are you? And they had to like check it with the management to make sure I wasn't a terrorist, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So I want you to, I think you're the youngest out of all of us here. And I want you to talk about how the, this new generation is embracing this much more than, you know, like past generations and like they're fighting for it now. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the, the being the youngest. I'm, I don't think I am the youngest among us, but I'll take that. I'll run with that title. Uh, I have seen a shift and I was born in 86. So right when Chernobyl happened, like that's when I was, you know, coming into the world and all my life, just like you said, the word nuclear has been, you know, a four letter word. Uh, and this is coming from somebody that has lived in a few different countries, the sort of uh, reaction that people get just to the word. Uh, just to the notion of energy generation through, you know, nuclear power plants. I mean, we grew up with really either hearing about Chernobyl or, you know, thinking about nuclear power plants uh, being a weird, toxic place where uh, Homer Simpson works. 
quite literally, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, which is a character that is known for being really stupid. There has been no, you know, positive reinforcement throughout our whole lives about nuclear. And this is changing. And it's changing in a manner that is actually quite surprising to me. Case in point, most people that were already invested in uranium and nuclear back in the day, whenever, you know, Trump was president, really expected his presidency to be very pro-nuclear. And I think most people were very discouraged whenever Biden came in or before that happened, because the, the idea was that, you know, this administration is not going to be, you know, to the same tune. I have actually seen the opposite happen. I have seen, you know, people on the left side of the aisle becoming less hateful of nuclear at the very least. You know, it, I'm not... I'm not saying that all of a sudden Greenpeace is pro-nuclear. That's probably the last domino. But uh, there are many, many people, whether politically positioned, uh, that have been bringing more information, you know, into just the general populace to understand, like, basal power is what we need and all the, the sexy, you know, solar panels and, and wind turbines that we've implemented are okay for a certain purpose, but they really don't do the job. And I think that that we're seeing, you know, a swing back to uh, just the basics, you know? I mean, even the fact that we're talking about energy and energy being so important, I think is a, a talk about the basics, you know? Uh, it, it was all about investing in high tech, in the next thing, in, you know, whatever's going to take over the world. And all of a sudden we're talking about oil, we're talking about coal, we're talking about nuclear. And I think that has brought the conversation of energy and as a result of, of you know, baseload energy with nuclear as, you know, a real viable option that we've been using for what, 70 years or something like that. Yeah, it works. And I mm -hmm. think finally, finally, the, you know, our generation is is coming to see that. Well, I love pulling the stats on how much energy, like a gram of nuclear um, or uranium can power to, to someone that doesn't know. And they're always like, holy, what? Like they just have no idea. Right. So I was like pulling out those stats. Um, Jesse, we're going to go back to you here and, and speaking of kind of following with Fabi here. What, one thing I don't think is talked about enough is how the United States and North America are going to power these, this electric vehicle revolution. Like, great. They need to build the batteries, but like, how are they going to power these batteries without a solution here? We're already seeing rolling blackouts and now we're just yeah. amplify, amplifying that and just expect that it's going to be all good. Yeah, absolutely. I think nuclear obviously addresses that issue as well. I want to go back to to Fabi talking about just before I address this, talking about nuclear kind of being demonized for so long. I think the final frontier that we now have to surpass with people who are hesitant is addressing nuclear waste or has as it's better said spent nuclear fuel. This is still the biggest misconception I see out there and I think maybe the last remaining barrier for a lot of people who don't truly understand nuclear energy is there's a belief out there and I get this comment all the time on my YouTube channel that nuclear would be fantastic, it's great, but we need to solve the nuclear waste issue. Well, it's been completely solved. Like the the ways of dealing with it are quite simple. Water, concrete and steel contain the nuclear fuel after it comes out of the reactor, after it cools off for a period of years. It's then transported, buried very deep underground in extremely safe casks which are impenetrable with essentially there's no such thing as a zero chance, but it's as close as zero as you can get of it ever contaminating the environment and the radioactivity wears off until it's completely harmless. The, all of the nuclear, this is a statistic that's been brought up again and again, but maybe some people aren't aware of it. All of the nuclear waste produced since the fifties in commercial nuclear reactors can be stacked into a football field. I think a certain number of, of meters high. It's, it's just such a small amount of waste when we consider other energy sources. So I think the key is to look to other energy sources as well and make a comparison when it comes to the quantity of waste. Um, but just the fact that it is essentially rendered harmless and we have a system in place to deal with it, I think is uh, is very important. Um, so to come to your point about 
this this EV infrastructure and and the charging that's going to be required. Um, yes, nuclear energy would help greatly with that. Obviously, we need more nuclear build out in the United States. I think this shift, the shifting of political winds to the point where there used to be a lot of different politicians and a lot of different governments who demonized nuclear energy. And those of us who believed in it were the ones who looked like the bad guys. Now that's been completely reversed. Now the people who are against nuclear are starting to look ridiculous. Uh, countries like Germany, the, not the country itself, obviously, but the leadership in place there. I, I think Austria as well. Australia, amazingly, has the largest uranium reserves in the world and yet does not want the, the politicians there do not want nuclear energy. So the zeitgeist is changing. So I think the EV infrastructure issue is obviously a long term problem that is going to be needed to be addressed over the course of the next years and decades. And we're going to need more nuclear to do that. And we're also going to need more domestic sources of uranium in America. It's ridiculous that as Gwen stated about 20% of the electricity grid there is powered by nuclear, yet there is almost no domestic production in any sizable quantity whatsoever. So, you know, obviously we're seeing some support for that. A strategic uranium reserve was created. The government did buy some pounds off of some companies. We'll see if if that progresses moving forward as well. Um, obviously the Inflation Reduction Act does contain um, some budget allocated to the nuclear industry. So hopefully we're going to see more domestic uranium production in the United States. I believe we will. It's inevitable. Um, so that would, I think, be the next most important thing moving forward. Right on. Hey, Gwen, we're all, uh, we're all uranium bulls here, but I'd like to hear a bear case that you, that you, you think should be on all of our thoughts. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> You're going to think I'm being uh, facetious here. What's the bear case, I guess? Okay, so the bear case is that there's another nuclear accident. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, then all of the progress that Jesse was just describing about the change in the zeitgeist gets reversed overnight. Um, <clears throat> and do I think that's likely? No. I mean, we go, as Fabi said, we've had 70 years of nuclear energy production. We've had... Only one real, like, it's only really um, Chernobyl that was like, the, the plant itself was the problem. Obviously, Fukushima, there was a natural disaster that was not sufficiently protected against. Um, and Three Mile Island, there's an operator issue. But still, they've all been really, except for Chernobyl, which was a big deal. Like, very few people, the actual harm to the population from those events versus the ongoing harm to the population from coal mining and burning um, is very minimal. At the end of the day, though, that doesn't matter. If we get a big nuclear scare of some sort, and I guess that could also be on the like arms side, if nuclear arises again as a really bad word in the world, then that could maybe... Uh, change the political zeitgeist. So I guess that's the bear case. I, Other than that, what's the bear case? That Russia and America become best friends again? Um, or that <laughs> um, we suddenly find and then permit the per build of new mines on a whole bunch of uranium deposits in short order, which is physically not, impossible. Not happening. Like, I really not don't happening. think that there is <laughs> yeah, yeah. a lot of bear case. Um, I think for leading up to the la up, up until about a year ago um so the uranium market bottomed back in 2016 and that was you know back when the producers of the world got together and said look we are being our own worst enemies we are producing too much uranium and there's too much excess sloshing around in the spot market there's just too much uranium kicking around so we got to stop producing so much if we want this market to come back together and big kudos to the uranium producers of the world i mean kazakhstan had been rising to that point they'd been rising just by pumping out more and more uranium they were just a market share mechanism but they too stepped back production everybody did they stepped back production because they're like we need to fix the problem and so they did fix the problem and it took almost, it took five years to work through all the excess inventory. There were stockpiles here. There was Japanese off sales here. There was all kinds of uranium kicking around in various stockpiles. Um, 
And uh, it took five years to work through that. Five years of the world producing significantly less than the world consumes and stockpiles supplying that gap along with, you know, some, you know, decommissioning of warheads and things like that. But, um, and then, and that's where we are now. Are there still a few stockpiles? Sure. There's still going to be few, a few. There's also now a new set of stockpiles who are the financial players. Those financial players didn't really exist five years ago. Now there are quite a few financial players who have stockpiled uranium um, to own it because they think it is worth more than what they paid for it. What will they do with their pounds? That's another question that sort of overhangs and one that the naysayers trot out where they say, well, if the uranium price runs, then, you know, Spot or Yellow Cake are just going to start selling off their pounds. I mean, Spot actually is not allowed to sell their pounds. They haven't given themselves the ability to sell pounds, which long term may be a problem for them, but we don't need to get into that right now. Um, so yes, I think the one of the hesitations that um, naysayers will pull out is, well, what about all the unknown inventory? And I just don't think that there is much inventory left out there. There's the financial players who are only in this game because they still expect the price to go higher. So I don't think that they're a significant concern right now. I don't think they're a significant concern in terms of selling until the price is quite a bit higher than it is right now. That's why they got into this game. Um, and other than that, I think we spent five years solving the inventory problem. I think going back to that sort of parallels, I actually think this is another parallel for base metals, for silver and copper. We're currently in the churning through stockpiles part of those markets. Yeah, we're in a deficit for copper this year. The deficit keeps getting worse as each month of the year goes by. We're like, oh, 2024 is not working out well for copper in terms of production versus demand. But there's a lot of copper in warehouses. Remember, just a few years ago, there was news stories every day about all the copper in warehouses in China that was being used as collateral for the housing market. That was a lot of copper. It's still being worked through. So there, those markets are still in that churn. Uranium did it already. So I don't think that that's actually a big risk. It is something that gets brought up. Um, but yeah, I think the only real bear risk to the uranium market is a massive change in sentiment in this pro-nuclear sentiment that's developed because of an accident. And I don't think that that's likely, but you know, there's always black swan possibilities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay. We, uh, I'm, I'm going to go around the table here and ask for a couple names from everybody. Um, told this is, this is not investment advice. Okay. We'll, we'll put that disclaimer out there. Um, but I just like to pick your you're all brains on kind of what stories you're looking at or what what uh, what you'd be telling your subscribers to 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 watch. So Fabi, I'll start with you. What are, what are your one or two or three top uh, picks in the, in the space right now? Man, that's a tough question. I I have <laughs> I have a, a lot on the line here, both in my own portfolio and uh, in uh, marketing deals that I have with companies. So I'm gonna try to pick companies that I have no. Uh, marketing association with and that I don't sit on the board of you know I'm not an insider or anything like that um I am going to say that you should at the very least watch GoVX I know it's wild to say that right now especially after everything that's happening in Niger all the back and forth um it's a company where a lot of the money that they raise actually goes into furthering their projects and they have soft pivoted. Their flagship is still Maduala, still in Niger, but uh, they have a couple of other projects outside of Niger that most people aren't really paying attention to. And this management team is one that I am a really big fan of, uh, but obviously because their their uh, main flagship project in Niger isn't Global Atomics Project, which is, you know, the darling of the space, then whenever there is bad news, they seem to, you know, bear the brunt of the downside move. And so uh, I think, go. yeah, exactly. I think people aren't really looking at their other assets and I think it's well worth investigating. So um, I'll mention GoVX. Um, the other one... I would say, I think Gwen is going to hate me for this because I, th I think that might be one of her picks. Uh, I'm going to throw out there COSA. COSA uh, is a new um, a new Athabasca Basin uh, focused explorer 
with uh, man- a management team that has a wild track record of success, one that is yeah, they, very they sure do. to replicate. So this is why I'm not going to mention anything in the U.S., even though that's probably my favorite jurisdiction. Uh, let's pick out, you know, Athabasca <laughs> Basin and uh, in Niger. Yeah, I um I sat down with Steve at COSA and looked at the targets at URSA, and yeah, you got to drill that that target. You just have to. It, it looks really, really, really attractive. And Steve's had uh, Steve's had some wild success in in the basin, so um, he he knows what he's doing. There, and let, let sure. me just say, uh, if if somebody is coming into this market and having zero exposure to the Athabasca Basin in 2024, that might be the biggest mistake. I am a you know a speculator in development plays through and through, but not having any exposure to the basin when we know how much drilling is happening right now and into the summer i think uh there's going to be a lot of fomo i can't pick out which ones are gonna really hit anything of value but nobody knows (laughs) someone's gonna hit somebody nobody knows i'm a big believer that i don't actually buy athabasca uranium stories unless they've got drilling results it's we know the odds of success there um, okay, thanks for that, Fabi. Gwen, do you want to chuck out a couple mm-hmm. names for our listeners today that you're you're pretty keen on, and you you can repeat the same ones? I do definitely own Cosa. Um, this is you know when you buy a, a play like Cosa, you're buying not just the uranium market is going, and I want exposure to that, but you're playing the potential to add on that discovery excitement, right? Mm-hmm. Um, sorry. Hey, Gwen, we'll. Uh, We'll move on to Jesse. Let's do that. Jesse, throw a couple names out there that you're uh, you're pretty keen on. I'd love to. I'll start off by saying I'm by far the least experienced of the the panel members here in terms of investing in and researching the uranium industry. And so for maybe anybody out there listening who's similar to my position, who's more um, maybe newer to the sector, then the first thing I would say is the ETFs, um, URNM, or my biggest position is always HURA, which is the Canadian equivalent. It holds, you know, a basket of miners, starting with the big producers, Camacocas, Adam Prom. It holds SPUT, the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, is a large percentage, Yellow Cake PLC, which is another physical uranium vehicle. So I think that's a great place to start for anybody who's maybe hearing this story for the first time or is kind of, you know, just started to explore the uranium industry. So I always keep the ETF as my largest position because I simply don't have the time, skill, or experience that Fabi and Gwen do to examine individual companies. Now, that being said, I definitely echo Fabi's sentiments about the Athabasca Basin. Um, aside from Cameco, of course, which is the one of the largest producers in the world and the only company currently in the Athabasca Basin producing uranium, um, I would look for a clear path to production. I think that's extraordinarily important. I personally don't play in the exploration uh, stage companies, again, because of my lack of, um, of knowledge and experience in the industry. But I think there's some developers um, that when you take a look at their path to production, it seems rather clear. Uh, companies like NextGen, obviously, with perhaps the greatest uranium deposit in the world right now, undeveloped uranium deposit, um, Denison Mines, I think those are the two companies in the Athabasca Basin I would watch because those are the only two in my mind right now that actually have a good shot of producing by, let's say, 27, 28, somewhere around there. Um, and then I would also point to energy fuels in the United States, because as I brought up earlier, um, the United States needs more domestic production. Energy fuels was one of the companies who was contracted by the U- United States government to sell uranium into their strategic uranium reserve um, because they had a, a fairly large inventory of uranium that they sold for for quite a nice profit at that time. And they've just restarted production at three of their mines in Arizona and Utah. They're preparing two more mines for production right now. They have the only licensed uranium mill in the United States, extraordinarily favorable mining jurisdictions. They have a lot of properties in Wyoming, which is, in my opinion, the greatest mining jurisdiction in the United States. Um, they have a rare earth component to them. We were talking earlier about China having a stranglehold on certain resources. 
the rare earths are one of them. And so energy fuels has rare earth property in Brazil. They also have some in America. They're also, they've got vanadium as well. They've got both a vanadium inventory and they're looking to produce more vanadium. They also have a fairly large uranium inventory still at the moment and they're completely debt free. So as far as an individual company, that would be the main one I would point people to. Jesse, you're pretty much convincing me to not sell my position. <laughs> <laughs> Don't sell, Fabi. <laughs> oh my God, Gwen, I felt I felt so bad for you. You're doing okay. I'm gonna try. Um, I'm gonna I support what's been said here. I think you can choose your categories for exposure. Certainly, discovery, awesome. If it works, it can work incredibly well. That's sort of the COSA side of things. Um, I think top tier development projects especially in the Athabasca, there's not very many. There's NextGen, there's Denison, there's Fission, right? These are going to become very well, are going to become, they already are, very well traded, very important stocks in this uranium market. Um, and NextGen is going to get built. It's the most important asset in the uranium um, world. The other category that Jesse pointed to is growing U.S. production. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I can talk about okay, well that. Yeah, I love that, Fabi. The, yeah, this we're here is what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> we're, we're here to support each other right now, so all good. Okay, so let me tell you, just in my my personal position, why I love the U.S. as a jurisdiction. And I'm going to assume that this is what Gwen means when, when she's talking about the U.S. Most people don't realize that the U.S. back, I think, in the 70s and 80s was, you know, the one, number one producer of uranium in the world. Uh, this was before, you know, Kazakhstan had, you know, all of their discoveries and production development, et cetera. And it was really the only game in town. Back then, the dynamics were more of, you know, partially for energy purposes, but a lot more for, you know, backing up the, the Cold War efforts and things of that nature. And so there was a lot of production. Um, the U.S., uh, really poured in lots and lots of dollars into figuring out where all the uranium was. And a lot of the deposits have already been found. Easy pickings is now for the companies to go back to the US and just look at what the known deposits are uh, and then bring those deposits up to, you know, like the, the modern or either modern exploration or, you know, accepted standards of you know being able to say hey here's a 43101 this is compliant and we can say that we have 20 million pounds we have 10 million million pounds whatever and so it's completely the opposite of the Athabasca basin where you know um you know for a fact there is uranium there you kind of know where it is you just don't know how much exactly is compliant and so there are a lot of companies that have, you know, are, that are currently working on bringing those to compliant resources. Uh, but we know where the uranium is most of the time, and the you know the 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 grades are much lower than what you'd find in the Athabasca Basin. But they're also closer to the surface. Uh, a lot of them are ISR amenable, and it's a completely different setup. So it, it's kind of more of a development area if you look at the USA as a whole, rather than, you know, completely greenfield exploration, at least that's the way I see it. And that's why I love the USA as a jurisdiction. And, and actually most of my holdings are in the US. Yeah. Well, I'll, uh, I'll bring that up. This um, one story that just kind of came across my screen yesterday was this Pegasus resources. Um, so I'm not a shareholder and I'm going to do some more work on it, but it's got a, a three, Three Interesting and a half, grab three, three and a half million dollar market cap and sampling yeah. up to eighteen percent at surface. And you know, I would assume that they've got some historical data from old oil and gas drilling or something like that that tells them that they're in the right formation somewhere. So that that's something I'm going to do a little homework yeah. on. Again, I'm not I'm a shareholder. A, I'm, a share, but... I'm a shareholder. So disclaimer there. Um, they're if I'm not mistaken, they're very close to um, a project by Energy Fuels. Uh, and so they're on trend and it, it's, mm -hmm. it's the, it's the same story, you know, they know where the old mine workings are and, you know, they just go in there and uh, just do modern exploration for something that's already in the ground. So absolutely. Awesome. 
Well, I think we'll wrap that up here today. And uh, thank you so much, all three of you. Um, you guys are all very meaningful to me. I've um, known Jesse and or I've known Gwen forever. And uh, Jesse, known Jesse for a long time and getting to know Fabi a lot and uh, really, really enjoy your values and your letters and your content that you put out in the uranium space. I think that all three of you are very, very well versed in the market. So if there's any listeners out there that want to learn more about um, uranium, uh, you can find all three of them on social media. Uh, Gwen's got a paid subscription service. Um, Fabi, are you charging for your, your intelligent content yet? No, because it's not very intelligent. It's just yeah, you should think about it today. <laughs> it's just the summary of news. <laughs> yeah, and uh, they're all they're all uh, very responsive. So um, thank you very, very much, everybody. And um, that's our chat on uranium.